When I got dressed this morning, I decided to wear a suit as if I was going to a funeral. And then I thought, you know, this is not a day just, just for mourning. This is a day to, to celebrate our freedom and to thank those who, who have helped to protect our freedom. This is also a day to say that as a, an American, I am proud of this country. And I am proud that we have men and women who are willing to put their lives in harm's way so that we can maintain a presence in the world today. So even if it is a country like Yemen or Indonesia, where there are not the same rights for humanity as we enjoy in this country, we have a way of putting pressure on those places because of our military. I am confused, though, because this week's tragedy in Thousand Oaks was perpetrated by somebody who had been trained and deployed by the U.S. military. So in talking with uh, several individuals, I said, what, what can I say? Here we are thanking our service individuals for giving of themselves. But then we have this tragedy that happens that is perpetrated by a service individual. So I'm going to make a call to the, to the American mind this morning. And I'm going to say something is not right when we don't take care of our military personnel. We need to know that if they are willing to give their lives in sacrifice for this country, we need to take care of them. If they have problems, we need to find answers for those problems. So I, I don't know if, if, if you feel that way, but that's, that's why I wore a a brightly colored tie today, because I'm, I'm proud of, of the country that we live in. I'm proud of the, the way in which we can go about a free election and express our, our hopes and dreams for this country. I'm proud of that, because my friends, you, you don't have to travel very far from these shores to know that this is a privilege that is not enjoyed by the majority of the rest of the world. God bless America. May, may what we have be something that we are not only proud of, but are willing to say, you know what? America came to be because it was a safe haven for individuals who wanted to worship God. We call them the pilgrims. Okay? And that since then we have said that it is a right that we are willing to defend with our lives. And many have. And we thank them for that. So let's, let's just say, uh, I don't want to sound political in any way, but I just want to say that America is a dream. America is an idea. And it's an idea worth living up to. Being our best selves. Being our best selves, I believe, means putting Jesus first. Now, that's a, that's a very Christian thing to say. But I'm saying if we have a, a dis determination in our minds today to put God first in our lives, let him be the leader of our lives, then deep, irrespective of who our leaders might be and what their beliefs are, we can live to our best self. We can live to the self that God would like us to live to. And I think that that, cumulatively, if we're, we're doing that, whether we're Christian or Buddhist or Hindu or, or Baha'i, Muslim, if we're living to the best self that God has for humanity, then I think that there will be a different kind of America 
that we can offer to the world. And I am hopeful. I want you to know I am hopeful. That is why I am saluting those who have passed with a dark suit. And I am wearing a very hopeful colored tie that includes everybody and everything that is joyful and, 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 and happy. And the fact that we are sitting here today in a church that was built, what, 1962? Have you seen the pictures? My friend Ben Maxson just retired as pastor of the Paradise Church. Yesterday, he lost that church and he lost his house. He had time enough to put a few things in his trailer, as in his, his travel trailer, his dog, his wife, his, uh, uh, his, a few belongings, and to get out of there before the flames came and his Facebook revealed uh, from his perch in Modesto with his son that his house is amongst the over 6,000 structures that have already been claimed by the flames in the Paradise Fire. Somebody put up on Facebook yesterday, quoting Milton, his great work, Paradise Lost. I don't know about you, but when these things happen, when these things happen, what, what wells up inside of me is the desire to say goodbye to you and to get in my car with whatever tools I have and with whatever ideas I have and go up there and help them. It's what I did one time when uh, a certain other tragedy called T Katrina happened and I had the opportunity to go with a number of uh, my fellow Christians, my fellow Americans, and to stay at a Latter-day Saint encampment on the shores of Mississippi where we were helping with the reconstruction, we were helping actually with the demolition of a number of apartment complexes where high on the wall was the watermark where every single refrigerator was taped up with duct tape and our strict instructions, do not open that refrigerator because the electric has been off for two weeks. Where as we pulled down the wallboard, the rats came out. We were wearing masks. We were using gloves. We were being safe. But I think the image in my mind of that destructive time was uh, emblazoned in a cul-de-sac that could have been in Stevenson Ranch. I mean, the houses were that big. Where all that was left was the concrete foundation and maybe a strip of, 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 of wood from the floor. And to talk with a man at that moment and say, uh, what happened? He was sleeping in a tent in his backyard, what was left of it. And he said, we tried, we tried so hard to tell our neighbor, come with us, come with us. And she didn't. She wouldn't. And they can't find her now. That wave came in 38 feet high, took out those houses, went almost 15 miles inland, and then when it subsided, it took the debris with it. And the sharks had Thanksgiving dinner. And here we sit. In these times, as our fellow Americans are dealing with the loss of everything in their life. And in some cases, the loss of life. I don't know about you, but I don't know what I would do if I was driving my car into a wall of fire. You'd probably say, let's back up. And then you look behind you and there's another wall of fire. You don't know what to do. You panic in that moment and you don't have a moment and you are consumed in your vehicle. Why does this happen? How does this happen? What on earth are we going to do next? It's why I chose, I chose as our scripture passage today, uh, Psalm 27. Uh, Birker, you can put that up if you want, but go to Psalm 27. There's, there's Bibles in your pew, pew rack if you really want to see it with your own eyes, which is always good to help you remember it. The Lord is my light and my salvation. 
Whom or what shall I fear? In, in, in Psalm 23, the, the psalmist says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of fire, I will not fear. If you remember nothing else from this moment, on this Sabbath, I want you to remember that the call of God on our lives today is that we will not fear. We will not. It's actually a very determined statement that David is making. In the face of all that he went through, in the face of the, the, the many battles that he fought, in the face of the fact that his very father-in-law hunted him. Yes, King Saul. Remember what the prize was for killing Goliath? You forgot that part, didn't you? But you see David, when he stood there looking at Goliath the first time, he was going, uh, guys, what do you get if you kill this guy? We, we, just, we just hear the song playing in our mind. Little David? No. <laughs> David was a shepherd. David had fought the bear. David had fought the lion and killed them. He's saying, I want to know what the prize is. I want to know what the prize is for killing this guy. Oh, yeah, you get the, uh, you, you get the princess. You get Saul's daughter, Michal. What? You become the king's son-in-law? Dude, that's so cool. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. I mean, we're like way down on the totem pole socially. If I become the king's son-in-law, that's going to be a huge social elevation. Besides which, he knew that God was with him and had been with him. When Saul offers him his clothing, he says, this doesn't fit. This is not my usual way of going into battle. I feel better in my own armor. He goes out into battle. He slays the giant, and he gets the girl. Let's not forget that that was the main reason why David went into battle. He got the girl. When he writes the 24th 23rd Psalm, verse 4, he is making a statement, I will not fear. This is not some cowering statement. This is a categoric, in your face, I will not fear. And I want you to know today that I have connected and still will connect and, and will many times more tell you this connection between Psalm 23, 4 and Revelation 14, 7, which says, the first angel was flying in the midst of heaven and had the eternal gospel. And he said, fear God. Friends, it's the same word. Pay attention. Pay attention to the God of heaven. Pay attention not to what is happening in this world today. Fires. Murder. Genocide. Don't pay attention to that. Don't let that cause you distraction. Focus on the one who can save you and who has saved others and who will save all of us in the future. And so that is why in 27 he says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evil men, or I'm going to say, when evil circumstances advance against me to devour my flesh, when my enemies and my foes attack me, which could also be bad thinking. Have you ever thought about that? That maybe the enemy is not a person, but a thought? Stinking thinking, some people call it. When those thoughts, when those thoughts advance against me and attack me, uh, they will stumble. They will fall. Though an enemy, though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. My interpretation, fear is what you pay attention to. Not going to pay attention to this stuff except as it requires 
my attention concerning helping. But we need, I need, you need, we need to make a decision today that we are not going to let these circumstances cause us to take our focus off of Jesus, our focus off of God, who is our salvation, just as our friend David has said. So, that being, I guess, a small preface to what we can say today, I would uh, I'd like to ask my wife to come up. She said she would read this story to you. Chris is a news hound, probably one of the reasons she took journalism in school at Pacific Union College all those years ago. And um, so she is the one who keeps me fully uh, briefed on a number of things. This one, by the way, has to do with why she went to a certain restaurant yesterday for lunch. You can tell them which one. So I heard this on the radio, actually, and it piqued my interest because it was a positive note in the middle of all the craziness that's been going on this week. And so I <clears throat> actually Googled it, and it took like three words to pull the story up, so that ought to tell you something about how, um, how much it may have captured others, other people's uh, thoughts and ideas as well. And maybe you've heard it. Um, and it's a story about an employee at Jimmy John's. Anybody heard the story? I can't be the only one. My oh, goodness. Oh, you're the only one. Okay. Well, that's good. Richard's, Richard heard it. All right. So so let me try and keep this straight. There's a lot of little moving parts here, so I'll try and be clear. There was a lady and her brother, and he was a veteran, so this all ties in with Veterans Day. And he had a, some kind of surgery on his spine. And she, um, the sister had flown up to Nebraska from Florida to help him through the surgery. And she'd gotten him home and settled, in, and it was time for her to go home. They didn't give all the details of that. She flew back to Florida, and as soon as she got off the plane, she had gotten a call from him saying, something's wrong. I'm bleeding. I don't feel well. Uh, my leg has gone numb. These are all not good things, I guess, if you've had surgery on your back. <laughs> and he had not called an ambulance because he was pretty sure that his insurance didn't cover it. He had not called an Uber or a taxi because he didn't have any money. So he had called her, and so of course she kind of panicked. She's just gotten off the, phone, uh, off the plane from seeing him. She's a long way away. She doesn't know what she can do to help him. And so she says, I'm going to call his, he has some sort of social worker or somebody who's working his case, I guess. She's going to call that person in Nebraska. So she calls, but she misdials. And she calls Jimmy John's in the town in Nebraska where he lives, and just starts into her story. She's panicked. I don't know if she was crying, but anyway, she's telling the story as fast as she can, and the you know, manager on the other line, line at Jimmy John's, who's answered the phone, is kind of, you know, oh my goodness. She goes through this whole thing, and finally, I guess, uh, at the end, you know, when he says a few things to her, she realizes that she's misdialed. She's so embarrassed. She's apologizing. He's like, no, no, wait. I've got your number. Just hang on. Let me see what I can do. So he's, at the, he's the manager, I guess he can't leave, he can't leave the store, but he calls one of his delivery guys that works for Jimmy John's, who is also a veteran. He says, hey, this is the situation, is there something you can do here? And this other guy, the delivery guy, goes over, well, I think he first he calls his sister in Florida, explains who he is, asks if it's all right if he helps, and gets the address of her brother, goes to the house, finds the guy, picks him up, takes him to the hospital where they were able to figure out his issues, and he's now back home doing better. And I was just really entranced with this little story because of a number of reasons. Obviously, it's Veterans Day. It's about complete strangers helping each other and everything, and with a happy ending and a positive thing in all of the craziness in this world. And it, it fits in so well with, with what we're talking about with the, the sermon title day, the, the uh, intuitive. intuitive life. Because it's so easy at any point in that story for somebody to bow out and say, I don't have time for it. This was a mistake. Stupid woman, she made a mistake. I mean, there's any places in the story that, that somebody can bow out and say, it's not my problem. But they did something. And it touches people's hearts. Like I say, I only had to put like three words into Google to find the story. Because it touches people's hearts and souls when they see what Jesus did, when Jesus went about doing good in the community, he didn't say, it's not my problem. 
He was looking for people who need help, and sometimes they came to him, and sometimes he had to look up in a tree to find them. But he was looking for people who needed help and who were seeking him. Thanks, love. So she ate her usual sandwich at Jimmy John's yesterday. My wife is gluten-free, and Jimmy John's happens to be one of the only ta places in town where you can get a sandwich wrapped in lettuce. Raise your hand if you know the other place. In and out burger. Yes. Animal style and protein style. Thank you. If you so choose to be gluten free, there are at least a couple of places where you can get a sandwich in town that is gluten free. Uh, it doesn't happen in all the places. We wish, we wish that places like Dink's had uh, uh, you know, gluten free bagels, but we'll just have to settle for what Chris makes, which is awesome uh, sourdough bread, which he can eat at times. But Jimmy John's uh, goes down in our books as at least in this circumstance, as being the kind of place that has individuals working for it, first of all, that they had hired a veteran, thank God for that, and that they uh, were willing to let veterans help each other. Okay? Uh, there, there are organizations that we are saluting today that are, are very interested in making sure to help each other. And I do know that there are many veterans organizations that are out there to help with the coming back, the switching off of the mode that, that military individuals are in when they are out on the job in other parts of the world, and that they need to come back and that they need to be reintegrated. I'm just praying that those kinds of organizations will not only flourish, but that they will also be blessed, and that places like Jimmy John's and the attitude that this, that this man who was off-duty that he had, that, that it was just who he was to go ahead and say, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do it, I'll do it. Three things, because I've got to say it real quick. Time is up. I'm going to ask that as we go through this next week that we look to God. Let's continue, let's continue to look to our God to be our leader. And more than that, I'm going to ask you to be active. It's something that I've asked in the series that we've been doing, The Incarnational Life. Watch for what God is doing. Okay? Many people are interested in knowing uh, what the Seventh-day Adventist Church is doing. I'm interested in that too, by the way. Uh, but the fact is, I'm actually more interested in what God is doing. Okay? I'm more interested in how he is working out his plan of saving all of humanity. And I, I, I've found, and I'll just give my own testimony at this point, that it is always surprising when I pay attention. Because what we find is that God is using all kinds of people to do his business. He's not just using those who even call on his name as Christians. He's using anybody who will respond to that intuitive inspiration, we might call it, of the Holy Spirit. And let's not forget, in the book of Joel, he said that in the last days, he is going to send his Holy Spirit on, oh, just the men, right? What, no amen from the ladies? Just men. He's going to send his Holy Spirit just on the men. Okay, so you have read your Bibles. He said, all flesh. Like that, don't you? King James. <laughs> all people. In that song that you were singing today, I kept saying instead of that I'm just a man, God, don't crush me. I'm just, I'm just a human. How about that? I'm just a human. God is interested in all humans. And he's using anybody who will be used. So I'm saying this week, keep your eyes open because that boss that swears and curses and treats other people terribly, when he suddenly does something out of the ordinary, if you're not watching, if you're not paying attention, you might not see that God actually got a hold of him, got through to his mind, and that he did something nice for somebody. 
That for a change, he was not selfish. He was unselfish. These are evidences, my friends, of God's intervention in people's lives. And it's not only just for them, but it's because they are being used in his salvation plan. So, number one, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Number two, watch for what he is doing in the world today. And number three, here's where it gets very personal. Um, I want you to ask God to send his Holy Spirit into your life. And you're thinking, duh, will I do that? Really? Really? Because if you, if you ask God to send your Holy Spirit, the Holy, his Holy Spirit into your life, you are basically saying, I no longer am going to have control over my life. I'm giving control over my life to you, God. I'm going to let you lead in my life. That's really hard. So it may sound just like some religious jargon, but when the rubber meets the road this week and you pray earnestly, honestly, God, I want your Holy Spirit to lead me this week, just understand that that is a revolutionary prayer. It basically says, I'm going to walk through this valley this week and I'm going to walk following you because that's the other part of verse 4. It says, I will not fear. Why? Because you are my shepherd. And I'm watching you. And I'm following you. That decision, my friends, may put you at odds with your community. It may put you at odds with people at work. But God is going to work it out. He is going to lead and guide to still waters, to green pastures. This is his promise, and I'm asking that you claim that promise today. Uh, just know that there are stories that we could all tell. There are Bible stories of individuals who had their minds changed by the infilling of the Holy Spirit. That will have to wait for another time. I just want you to know that this week belongs to you and me, what we do with it, will be either to God's glory or not. So that is my appeal to you today, to live your lives in such a way as to glorify your Heavenly Father because you're watching Him and you've asked Him to live in your life. You've lived the intuitive life. Amen.